Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Turning Point UK Presents, The Esther Craker Show. Today I'm here with Lance Foreman, a former MEP and businessman, and I'm going to ask him some questions about Brexit, conservatism, and just where he sees the future of the UK going after we leave the EU. Finally! Thank you, Lance, for coming. Pleasure. Always a pleasure. <laughs> um, so I just want to ask you about how you became a conservative in the first place. I just want to understand how your sort of political views um, evolved in that way. I became a conservative. Oh my yeah. God, that goes back to ancient history. Okay. Uh, it's back in my college days, actually. Uh, okay. Unlike today, where students can't tell people they're conservatives, in my day they could. And uh, when Margaret Thatcher was in power, you know, whilst you know, students tend to be more on the left, uh, there were certainly many students uh, like me that were very happy to support uh, the Conservatives and so through my college days I was involved. I, I was involved with a lobby group after I left college called the Adam Smith Institute, okay. which is a sort of free market uh, a think tank and they're still going going strongly today. Yeah, right? I was about um, to ask, are they still going? They are very much still going and uh, you know, the, the, and, and indeed many young people are involved uh, with the Adam Smith Institute today. Yeah. Uh, I'm probably one of the older... Uh, oh, uh, don't say it! One of the, 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 the older um, uh, people that turn up at their events. Um, but um, young at heart, of course. Yeah, naturally. Um, and then um, through the Adam Smith Institute, um, I was introduced um, to Peter Lilly and I became his special advisor. Okay. That was back in 1991-92, so for a couple of years when he was Secretary of State for Trade and Industry. Um, and then he moved after the 92 election to the Department of Social Security. And at that point, I decided that wasn't really something that I was you uh, carry on uh, particularly interested in. And uh, I had to make a decision whether or not I would join our family business uh, yeah. at that time. We are 100 to, well, 115 year old salmon smokers. And okay. um, I decided that, yes, it, you know, I was the fourth generation and so I decided to um, get involved. And then I sort of got drawn back into local politics, actually. Um, during the Olympics, because okay. our, um, oh, wow, our uh, well, it was uh, I wasn't an athlete. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I figured. <laughs> um, uh, but um, our, we we found ourselves in the rather unique and uh, uh, position of um, having our business located literally uh, on the on where the government wanted to build the running track of the Olympic Stadium. Okay. And we were one of 350 businesses that were being booted out of the East End of London to make way for this park. And uh, we were being treated very badly and I became the voice of all those businesses and, and ended up in this huge battle with Ken Livingstone, who was the Mayor of London at the time. And of course, there was another young fellow uh, standing to become Mayor yeah. at the time and that turned out to be Boris, Boris Johnson. Johnson yeah. And so because we had this enemy in common, I got to know uh, <laughs> I got to know Boris quite well, and in fact, he officially opened our premises and he launched his mayoral manifesto from uh, my very building. Okay. Um, so I sort of got drawn back into the political world again. And then, of course, the referendum came along and I, I've been passionately um, anti-EU for many years, actually. Yeah. I, I've been very concerned about uh, the road that the EU is heading. Um, so an opportunity came up to uh, get involved in that and I spoke. Um, uh, and was quite vocal and did quite a lot of media sort of stuff um, for the Vote Leave campaign. Uh, and that was, um, you know, both of the, you know, both the Leave and the Remain campaign were finding it difficult to have business people that were vocal, vocal yeah. because the country was so split. You know, if you say, you know, we've got to vote this way, we've got to do this, you could be offending half your customers. Kind of customers. So, I, I wanted to ask yeah. you, actually, I wanted to touch a bit on that, just to see how, you know, your political views kind of gelled in with your business, you as a businessman. Yeah. So, you know, how did you coincide, you know, being ideologically and, I guess, politically conservative with, you know, your business? Do you think that kind of gelled well together? Or? I don't necessarily think it made much difference, you know, and there are many business people that were on the Remain side, many business people on yeah. the uh, on the Leave side. I think what was quite unfortunate was that um, when you do media interviews, um, you know, they tend to want to just grab a, a soundbite. Yeah, you know, exactly. The BBC or Sky come along, you know, they do this 20 minute interview with you, but they only broadcast sort of 15 seconds. Yeah. And they know what they want before they, you know, even come along to, they're just waiting for those right words. And so what, um, what they always sort of projected of me was uh, talking about the bureaucracy of the EU. And there was this funny story, absolutely true, where we had to spend literally tens of thousands of pounds reprinting all of our smoked salmon packaging so that it could have an EU warning sign on the back saying contains fish. Absolutely bonkers, yeah. but that was sort of EU rules. And 
the frustrating thing for me was that whilst, of course, the bureaucracy of the EU was an issue for me, and yeah. I think that it's bad, we might still have a lot of bureaucracy even once we've left the EU, because, yeah. you know, the British uh, civil service has got into this bureaucratic mindset which we need to shake off. But my issue um, for leaving the EU wasn't so much about that. It was more about the direction that... The EU is so taking the, Europe. This European federalist state. That it, exactly. It was the, it was the macro argument yeah. rather than something relating to my specific business. Awesome. Um, so after what three and, uh, and a half years, more than that, we're finally leaving the EU. Yeah. I mean, what made you support Boris's deal in the first place? And do you think that's going to deliver a real Brexit? That's a very good question. Um, so, I um, I became very frustrated with the Conservative Party, and yep. particularly Theresa May. And, and for me, she had crossed a red line when she invited Jeremy Corbyn into number 10 Downing Street, having said, this man is unfit to lead. And then suddenly she gives him all the credibility uh, of a meeting at number 10. And for me, that was, uh, you know, that was a red line. And I decided at that point, I can't support the Conservatives anymore. Um, and I joined the Brexit Party, I had a conversation with Nigel Farage, and he was keen to have me involved. And, you know, um, I, I became a, the, um, one of the two Brexit Party MEPs for London. And the Brexit Party was, you know, riding high, and mm. they did a phenomenal job. You know, in the European elections, it was that that was the catalyst for getting rid of Theresa May, um, changing the Tory party stance on Brexit. And Boris came along, and the Brexit Party support uh, started to flounder. And um, we knew, um, you know, the Theresa May deal was terrible. Yeah. And when Boris came back from Brussels with his deal, a lot of people said he's never going to do it, he's never going to achieve it. I actually thought he would achieve it. I know Boris, and I thought he would achieve it. And when he said, you know, we are going to be out by the 31st of October, you know, I'm going to die in a ditch, he actually wasn't talking to the British public. He wasn't making a promise to them. He, that was a bluff in a negotiation with the EU. They had to make him think that he was going to, you know, he was so mad, he might even put himself in jail uh, yeah, to break so, the law on yeah. the, you know, on the, on the Ben Act. And he came back with a deal. And Is that a deal that you're happy with? Well, it's not a great deal, but you have to think. You know, he had his hands tied behind his back. He was blindfolded. He had, you know... You know, it was a, it was almost impossible, you know, to achieve any sort of deal, but it was a deal, in my view, that was good enough to unlock, to unpick the gridlock that we were in and move forward. And indeed, um, about you know, an hour after that uh, deal was announced, I was called by the Times newspaper and they asked me for my view, and I'd sort of, you know, spent a, an hour. It's nothing really. I'm yeah. um, taking, you know, skimming through the deal, and I said, look. I haven't gone through it in detail, but I think it is good enough. It's good enough. It's expensive. You know, we're still having to pay this 30, however many billion, um, to buy back the the opportunity to to leave with no deal because that is our strongest negotiating part, yeah. uh, card. But um, the I suppose the, the the problem then was that I was in conflict with Nigel Farage, Farage because yeah. he, he had said this is the second the worst deal in history. Yeah. But of course, he has now come on side. And I think most of the Brexit Party, um, you know, uh, MEPs will actually be and have, you know, supported uh, supported the deal. Well, I mean, you're a businessman. Um, so, what do, what opportunities do you think that this Brexit deal, or just Brexit in general, will have for Britain, um, sort of at the end of this year when we actually? Well, I think you know immediately a um, there's a positive, and that positive is the fact that we've actually made a decision, and so you know the country isn't gridlocked with the uncertainty, and you're already starting to see investments sort of pouring into the UK, and people in the UK actually starting to make investment decisions themselves. Yeah, I mean that is the the the, the biggest problem for any business is un, you know, is uncertainty, and now you know we've nailed it down, and it didn't matter which way actually, but you've nailed something down. It means that people can invest with confidence. And it's, it's, you know, fascinating that, you know, you had all these sort of multilateral organisations saying that Brexit's going to be a complete disaster for Britain. Yeah. And just since the start of I the mean, year, the IMF, OECD, CBI, well. you know, they're starting to say, actually, Brexit could be quite good for Britain. Didn't Hugh Grant say that as well? Like Brit Britain is finished or something because we've voted in the Conservatives. I'm sure you don't follow the life and times uh, no, of Hugh Grant. No, he did. I mean, Hugh Grant did say that. And, uh, you know, I think he'll come to regret it, actually, because I think... Um, you know, I, I've got a, um, you know, uh, I've got a feeling that uh, we are going to create something uh, 
special. called uh, something special. Uh, instead of BJ being Boris Johnson, we're going to create Brexit jealousy. Ooh. Brexit jealousy Ooh. syndrome is going to be this new thing. I think other countries in Europe are going to be in Europe are going to be watching us very, very, very closely. Yeah. And um, you know they will see us start to thrive. You know our economy to thrive. You know the whole world is now open to us. We can do trade deals with other countries. And I don't think the trade deals are the be all and end all. But you know we have a unique opportunity, which I think you know British businesses will seize. Uh, to look globally and not think that we're tied to Europe. And, and I just think that the opportunity is, you know, I think this is a real renaissance for Britain, actually. I think it's, you know, but, really a great opportunity to, you know, to rethink our way forward. But what do you think, because my concern with Brexit is how it affects generations, not in the sense of the fact that we're leaving the EU, that's not, it was just the whole hysteria behind this of Brexit vote and how it divided the country. And, you know, ultimately the Brexiteers got, their way because they were the majority that voted and you know we are actually leaving the EU with or without a deal at the end of the year. How do you think this will affect sort of generations voting especially you know 20, 30 years down the line with the Conservative Party and just with how it will shift sort of younger people's political opinions? You know I think the division came about because um, we didn't pull together immediately after the vote you yes. know so we kept the thing going. Britain had been divided on Europe for decades. Yeah. You know, there are some people that thought, you know, we should turn right and others thinking we should turn left, not politically right or left. And, and you know, some wanted to be in, some wanted to be out. And that was the reason we had that referendum. And what should have happened immediately after the referendum, as Donald Trump said, actually, we should have moved quickly to effect it. Because most people weren't as binary um, on this thing yeah. as, you know, you often hear in the media. People weren't hard Remainers or hard Leavers. Most of the people I know, and most of my friends actually, were Remainers. But, you know, they weren't, you know, mad, you know, heading one way or another. Most of them were sort of saying, look, my head's heading this way and my heart's going that way. And I can see advantages and disadvantages. But what we should have done, the minute the, the referendum happened, we should have said, that's the way the country's voted. Let's just go there. And and I think we're seeing closure now. It's taken three years longer than it should have yeah. done. But we're seeing closure. And I think that, you know, most people just wanted to get it done, as Boris said. And I think that, um, I think that's a great thing. And I think for the, the future of this country, I think it's also a really great thing because over the last few years, the subject matter changed. I don't believe it was just about Brexit post-referendum. It was it was more about democracy. Yeah. You know, and when I was canvassing as a uh, f you know for the Brexit party in uh, May uh, last year for the European elections, there were Remainers that were saying to me, "We're going to be voting for the Brexit party because we feel that once people have decided something and they've made a vote." You should uphold that. And I think many mainstream sort of Remainers also came out and said that. I mean, Piers Morgan said that um, quite a few times. That he voted did, to yeah. remain, but, you know, he he would vote for the Brexit Party to, well, not vote for the Brexit Party, but he, he did want democracy to be respected in that way. Uh, absolutely. But yeah. I'm just concerned. Do you think young, because young people overwhelmingly voted to stay in the EU. Yes. How do you think this is going to affect voting patterns in the gener in generations well, to Well, I think a lot of young people voted to stay in the EU because that's what they've been taught. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, we need to have a major shake-up. Uh, not just in you know the civil service as Dominic Cummings says he wants to do but in education too you know when I was at school you know even teachers that you were friendly with you never knew their political views. views yeah you know and certainly when my children have gone through school they've told me that you know this teacher's sort of you know voting this way or this teacher's teaching them this polit uh, political uh, viewpoint and you know and you know, if you mentioned something sort of slightly right of centre, you know, it would be sort of crushed or laughed at. Mm. And I think that has to change. You know, uh, education is about being taught how to think and students should be able to make up their own minds. And, you know, and students, uh, you know, always rebel. They've always yeah. rebelled. That's yeah. what they do. It's what students do. But it's weird, isn't it? Conservatism is now the new counterculture. Well, I, I, never th I never thought that would be... That so would they be... should be rebelling against all the, all the leftism <laughs> that they're taught in, uh, yeah. in college now. And, you know, who knows? But I think that can change quite quickly. And I think that, you know, it's going to take years before the Labour Party pull themselves together. Boris is in power now for two terms. So we have a really wonderful opportunity to actually sort of change the culture. Okay, just two questions just to wrap up. There's a bit sort of left of what we've been talking about, but I just wanted to get your views because this is some, something that I've seen come a lot, um, come up a lot. It says on your Wikipedia page that you're a climate change denier. Does it? <laughs> it does. Okay. Do you want to sort of clarify that? 
Um, well, I, I would say the best way to clarify it is never believe anything you read on Wikipedia. Okay, awesome. Um, because there's tons of stuff on Wikipedia. And um, in fact, this very week, we've been uh, trying to re-edit some of the, or people have tried to re-edit things that are on our Wikipedia page. Yeah. And, you know, and immediately an alert goes out to the person that edited it previously. And so much of it is just politically driven. driven yeah. And, you know, what I would say to anybody is if you really want to know the facts, never trust Wikipedia. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm a sceptic on, yeah. uh, on um, climate change. I wouldn't say I'm a denier. I think that uh, th this, uh, this strategy to plant a trillion trees is a really interesting strategy. Um, but, you know... Don't trust Wikipedia. Yeah, don't trust Wikipedia. Don't I'm, trust I mean, it. I think I think I agree with you in that sense. I'm I'm a skeptic in the sense that I think <clears throat> media motivations behind this whole phenomenon is is very alarming, especially with the whole Greta Thunberg. Why is she not in school? Why is she sitting there staring at Donald Trump, giving him evils when he's doing his job? Well, <laughs> I think that's getting a bit ridiculous. All these multilateral organisations, whether it's the EU or the UN, they love climate change yeah. because. Climate is something that doesn't stop at national boundaries. Yeah. And because it sort of, you know, is global, it gives them greater power and greater strength. So they keep throwing money into anything to do with climate change because it, they will say that it needs this multilateral organisation to be able to deal with it because if one country can't do it by itself. Well, they fly so a private jet as well. well. Well, absolutely. There's so much hypocrisy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, but, I, you know, my view is that, you know, yes, the climate, it's always changing. And it's changing now. Um, I don't know if it's man-made. There are theories that it is, and there are scientists that say it isn't. Uh, but what I would say is that the, the, the human instinct is an instinct of survival. And we will find ways, you know, science and the human brain are so powerful. And the, the, the instinct to survive is so powerful, we will find solutions to this. Um, you know, a few months ago, I, I read on some social media channel that... Uh, in Some Israel, social media channel. Uh, uh, I can't remember which one on Twitter or Facebook, or whatever. <laughs> but um, um, uh, some Israeli organisation mm. has developed this new bacteria that eats carbon dioxide. Who knows where that will lead? There are yeah. so you know there are so many. Uh, there, the, the, you know, I, I'm sure that the human brain will 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 solve this problem. Yeah, that's the kind of optimism that I think <clears throat> needs to kind of come back into the mainstream media because I think we definitely need a dose of that. And so my last point. You know, <clears throat> one thing I found very scary at the last general election was um, the push towards Corbynism yes. and this idea that, oh, we're not anti-Semitic, we're just anti-Israel. Yes. And there was a movement that willingly or unwillingly a lot of young people supported. And you're obviously very pro-Israel. How do you how do you think we should change the conversation around Israel and sort of blatant anti-Semitism that's ravaging sort of the Labour Party in the UK? How do we change that conversation so younger people maybe not just realise, but actually come to the side and say, OK, let's have a constructive conversation about this without being either blatantly anti-Semitic or just anti-Israel for no reason. Uh, you know, I think so much of it comes back to education again. It's the same with climate <coughs> change and all these issues. It's, it's how people are taught. And sometimes you have to educate the educators. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, what has recently uh, just happened with this 75th um, anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz has been extraordinarily powerful. Um, you know, it's been right across the media, um, and I think that they really have honoured it very well. And you know, I think you know, it's it's through things like that that people learn. You know, we need to take uh, students and school children and teachers to Auschwitz and to learn about you know where you know where this can all lead. You know, where hatred can lead when it goes horribly wrong. And yeah, I, I do believe that so much of the anti-Semitism today stems from a misunderstanding of what goes on in Israel. Yeah. You know, when you take somebody to Israel, they come back with a completely different view to the perception they had before they ever went. Yeah. And I would recommend to everybody, just go there, see for your own self. You know, you walk along that, uh, that beachfront in Tel Aviv, there are Jews socialising and playing with Muslims and Arabs and Christians and Everybody gets on. It's a real melting pot. It's an incredible place. People get on. You know, um, the, the Arab population that live in Israel have higher standards of living than Arabs living anywhere in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this, um, and it's really interesting now that Israel is actually forming allegiances with other Arab countries in the Middle East. Yeah. You know, why would they do that 
if you believed some of the nastiness that's coming out of sort of you know anti-Semitic um, stuff on the left, on the right as well to some extent. But um, so I, I think you know it all comes back to education, education, and we've got to keep fighting. Yeah, definitely. That's the work we're aiming to Absolutely. do. Absolutely, doing great work. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for coming online. It's been a pleasure having you. Always a pleasure. Thank you.